Welcome to Columbia. We are so glad you are here and grateful to be together, whether in person or online. If you are new to Columbia, fill out a Connect card at columbiabaptist.org backslash connect. For every completed card, $25 is donated to our Spend Yourself Food Pantry. Now let's get ready to worship God together! selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
reading a little book on gratitude in the past several weeks, I took the advice of the author and I started a gratitude journal. The author's suggestion was that you write down at the very beginning of every single day in your gratitude journal three things for which you are grateful and that you are not allowed ever to repeat those three things again. So the first day is a breeze. You write it down. Second day is not that hard either. Just about anybody can probably come up with six things they're grateful for. The third day, nine. Not so hard either. I found that on the fourth day, this started getting really hard. I'm three weeks into this now, and it might take me half an hour to reflect on my life enough to find something I haven't said yet, something that I have forgotten to be grateful for. And that act of remembrance 
is slowly changing my heart toward this moment in this situation. And I want to challenge you in these days that to start a gratitude journal today and every single day, seven days a week, 21 things each week you're grateful for. And hear me again, remembering the goodness of God in the past causes us to live in the moment because we start to recognize, we start to see what he's up to right now. I'm grateful for sleeping in because it's just super great and a lot of days I can't do it, so I'm really grateful when I can. And one of the things I am grateful for is jumping on the big bouncy thing at Great Country Farms. This huge pillow that can bounce up and it's so high. And yeah, and also I also like that the brownies that when they come fresh out of the oven smell so good, just so good. I am grateful for those those moments where I'm either feeling inadequate or I don't have the right words to pray to God. Um, and I'm listening to a praise and worship song on Pandora or whatever, and all of a sudden that song comes on that has those lyrics that that embodies what it is that you're trying to get across in prayer or um, helps you feel the love of God um, in, again in those moments of feeling inadequate. I'm grateful that God brought us to Northern Virginia for such a time as this. God only knew that we would be placed here in this environment when our son Sean would go home to be with the Lord. Columbia wrapped their arms around us quite literally. They were here moments after he died. They were with us when um, we celebrated his going home and celebrated his life. They were with us and continue to be with us as we journey the sorrow and the sadness. I am grateful that God has given us a place like Columbia to call home. That I'm grateful that I am part of the children's ministry team that on the anniversary of Sean's birth, they had chocolate donuts, just the kind he liked, Boston cream donuts, filled Boston cream donuts, ready to serve for his birthday when I arrived at work. Man, I, I love those those chocolate donuts with the cream in them. I just love, you know, that that's going to make it into my uh, my gratitude journal. I haven't had one in a while, but it's going to make it into the journal. Now, you know, I, I think that as we think about all that we are grateful for in this season, it, it does take some discipline to become grateful for things that we've forgotten or even things we wouldn't normally express thanksgiving for. And so I, I really think that this book of Philippians is speaking to my heart in a powerful way. And, and I, I chose it because in my personal devotional reading, it was reaching out to me and I was seeing things that I had missed before in this moment, in the context of this moment. And, and I thought it could be just me, but the responses I'm getting from many of you as you read through the book of Philippians, are teaching me that this book is just as powerful for you. And in fact, some of the things I'm sharing are things that you're illuminating for me, that you're showing to me. 
So last week I started to talk to you about uh, what we call the choice paradox or what we might call option overload. And, um, and, and I said to you that, you know, it, it has been discovered that as we have too many choices, we do not become more contented. Uh, we do not become happier, but in fact, we, we find it more difficult to be content. And, and in that view, I want to sort of reach across uh, this idea and sort of present something that that creates in us. And that something is what we call FOMO or fear of missing out. Are you familiar with this term? It's actually a social term. Um, and it's being, uh, it's being dramatically increased these days because we know what we're missing out on, right? Everybody else on social media seems to be having a better life than we are. And, and never mind that they're presenting exactly what they want to and not presenting what they don't want to. Um, never mind that they're trying to make you jealous. That's the whole point. Um, we read that somebody's at least having a better night than we are, a better day than we are. And, and we're afraid that we're missing out. There's something that is, uh, is happening that we're not a part of. So FOMO originally, fear of missing out, actually is a psychological term that refers to f- being afraid of being socially isolated or socially Uh, left out. But it actually means more than that now. We talk about lots of things that we're afraid of missing out on. And in fact, a lot of economists are saying right now that the stock market, the the dramatic leap in the stock market since its uh, its huge drop is, is being created by fear of missing out, by FOMO. These incredible multiples, 22 to 40 times forward earnings, that's preposterous for a stock. But people are afraid they're going to miss out if they don't jump in to this market. And so they keep leaping, they keep jumping. And uh, some economists say there's going to be a reckoning for that at, at some point, as with all fear of missing out. Now, I also am taken by an idea that I saw presented by an author. I thought this was a a really clever way of speaking about this, which is F-O-M-O-M-G, which doesn't mean what you think it does. It's fear of missing out on my goals, of the things that I think I should be accomplishing. Now, this one I understand. I get this one in full. Now, I'm guessing that a lot of you are like me, so you come uh, to an area like D.C., you're attracted here by, I suppose, all the type A personalities, we all get here and then we, we, all, we all drive each other crazy, that's what we do. So when you come here, you probably are here because you have some ambition about what you can accomplish. It, it could be an ambition to earn a lot of money, but it may as well be an ambition to, to serve in some way or to make a difference or to have an impact, I, I don't know, whatever it is, change the world. That draws people like us to this region, and we get what we call here the creative class. We're one of the the hubs of the creative class in North America. And so you probably come from a background that's something like mine. Now, I would say that I have created what I came from, which is what I'll call a high-expectation family. Do you guys understand what a high-expectation family is? Now, a high-expectation is a double-edged sword. And there's a sense in which I, I would not want to have had it any other way because high expectations taught me that I could do a lot with my life. And they taught me that the choices I made really mattered and that if I applied myself, I could accomplish something. But the problem is this high expectation is so high sometimes and we absorb it, we take it in, it becomes the way we think, not just the way we're taught, that sometimes we start to believe we could accomplish anything we wanted to, anything we set our minds to. So we have these unrealistic expectations about what life should produce for us, about what our marriages should produce for us, about what our families should produce for us, about what our churches should produce for us. We start to believe (coughs) that we are entitled to a very high level of achievement. Well, ultimately, you know what happens if you're old enough, and I'm getting old enough now, you're going to hit some walls. First of all, you start to realize you really can't do anything you want to. You may not have the skills, the gifts, the competencies to get done something that was on your dream list. It it may just be that you discover, I'm not wired to accomplish that thing. And and you can't create this capacity. Your mind just doesn't work that way. You know, so I have a literary mind it's not a mathematical mind. I can, I can do math pretty well, but I, I, was never, I was never going to be an Einstein, I can assure you, a physicist. That just wasn't going to happen. Didn't matter what I dreamed. Didn't matter how hard I worked. At the end of the day, it's just not what God made me to be. 
And then you run up against other walls too. For example, your background does have something to do with what is possible in the future. It does. There's just no getting around it. You're, you're born with certain advantages or disadvantages. That's just, that's just how it is for all of us, and many things can define those. There are lots of things I can talk about here, but at the end of the day, I'll just tell you that if you come from a background like mine and you're wired like I am, your expectations will always be so much higher than what can be realized that at the end of the day, you may become quite ungrateful. It's, it's really difficult to accommodate. I do this in the small things even. So I'll plan something. Let's say it's the perfect getaway or the perfect date or the perfect Thanksgiving celebration with family or, or the perfect Christmas because the holidays are coming up. And The problem is there's no possible way that these occasions could ever live up to my expectations, much less the people who are surrounding me in them and much less myself. And so then when the expectation isn't realized, this is what goes on with this high expectation thing, then I assume it must be my fault that it didn't go the way I imagined it could go. So there's all sorts of stuff that happens there. Now listen, there's a voice that lives in the back of my head that plays this tape all the time. Just in case you don't know me well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to know this voice plays 24 hours a day, and it has to be reckoned with, it has to be dealt with. I dream about this sometimes, I think about it when I'm in quiet moments, when I'm preaching, I think about it. My expectations for what a sermon should be are always so high that if I ever watch myself, I'm always disappointed. Not once do I ever watch myself and go, that was a pretty good sermon. I don't do that. It, that voice in the back of my head makes that really complicated and hard. Well, the problem with this level of, call it ambition, aspiration, whatever it is, is that it is a cancel culture for gratitude. But to the contrary, gratitude is a cancel culture for all that I just talked about. So I'm grateful in my marriage for what my wife is able to offer me in relationship without unrealistic expectations of what no human being could possibly offer. Grateful for what my kids are able to accomplish and achieve in their lives and do with the understanding that I'll always have so high expectation and will have imprinted it on them that there will always be in their lives probably a certain measure of disappointment. My wife has a funny saying. She says, we do the best we can. The rest is up to a counselor. And I think there's some truth to that. So, so we, we get this level of expectation, and the result is personal ambition. That's what these expectations produce. Now, the Apostle Paul has credibility. He's got street cred for me to speak on these issues for a number of reasons. Now, the, the obvious one is that he is such a deeply devoted follower of Jesus Christ. He's a whole life disciple, and so that gives him credibility, and he is writing what has become for the church the Word of God, and that gives him credibility. And the early church regarded him as, as the very voice of God as he wrote his letter, so, so that gives him credibility. But there are two experiential things that give him credibility, and the first I've already talked about. And that is that as he writes the book of Philippians, his situation is so dire, it's so difficult, and he is in the midst of that so grateful. So his capacity to modulate his expectations, his capacity in that situation to appreciate whatever God has given him because God's glory is being shown, that gives him credibility, but the second one is even bigger for me, and that is I know that Paul is my brethren in the Spirit. I know that he was reared in a high-expectation family. I, you, you can't read Paul without seeing that. I know that he had tremendous ambition as an attorney. That's what a Pharisee was in his day. And I know that he achieved a great deal. And I know he went to the very best educational institutions of his day. So he was the Harvard graduate of his day. I know that he dealt with expectations. And so I know it is possible through the discipline of gratitude, among other things, obedience to God, to get to a place where we can be in any given moment contented. Paul has credibility 
to speak to type A Washingtonians like you and me. Paul gets it. Now, that causes some people not to like Paul, honestly. I had one person call me last week and say, can I talk to you about Paul? I'm like, oh, I, I, just so we're clear, I, I'm getting older, but I didn't really know Paul, okay? So they say, well, I, I'm reading these scriptures, Philippians, and then a couple of, I, I've decided I don't really like Paul. <laughs> I was like, well, that's okay. I, I would advise you not to say the same of Jesus. But with Paul, I mean, you can like him, you can lump him. But let's talk about his credibility to speak to this issue. Let's talk about how he understands a moment like this. And Philippians is written for a moment like this. Now, there are two lenses through which you can look at the book of Philippians. So let me take on professor teacher mode for a moment and tell you what they are. And one of them is the primary text for today. And when we get to it in a moment, I'm going to tell you why it can be one of the lenses through which you look at the book of Philippians. And the other is the one that I'm using. So if we use an experiential lens, as we ask the question, where did Paul wind up with regard to how this impacts your life? What's the so what of the story? You can take that so what and then walk back through the book. And that's what we're doing. So the so what, and I've been trying to teach you something new about this so what passage every week. And today I'm going to teach you two things that fit together about this amazing passage of Scripture. And this amazing passage of Scripture is found in Philippians 4. I'm using verses 4 through 7 and 12b through 14. And again, you should have memorized it by now. But it, it reads like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll, I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Could you just, just hang on that one for a second and tell me how it fits? Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I have learned the secret. This is, this is a grabber for me. You got the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, let me come back to a couple of these pieces. First of all, let's talk about why Paul couldn't have made any money as a self-help book writer. Now, if Paul were paid for the number of people who read the Bible, he'd be a very wealthy man. But he would have been a pretty lousy self-help writer, and here's why. Because if you read a self-help book that says it has the secret... What is that secret? It's the secret to being a great leader. It's the secret to making a lot of money. The secret to being very successful. The secret to realizing all your hopes and dreams. That's a good self-help book. Paul writes exactly the opposite. I've got the secret to being contented in whatever situation. If I accomplish nothing, happy. If I accomplish a lot, happy. If I'm rich, happy. Poor, happy happy. Hungry, happy. Fat, happy. Paul's happy in every situation. Now that should be a message that resonates, but too often it doesn't. With us though, as whole life disciples, this is the message that should resonate because it is the message that rescues us from our own expectations and unrealistic ambitions. This is what rescues us from ourselves. Now, let me come to the point that is so intriguing in just a moment. But before I do that, let me just review a few things that we've learned. Okay, we've learned that fear produces anxiety, anger, depression, etc., which is why right now we're seeing so much. Anxiety, anger, and depression. It's all because of fear, not because they are warranted. We can, though, choose our emotional responses. This is provable. You can choose your emotional response. Maybe not your first reaction, but your long-term response. Anger is a defense mechanism. It hits us in a moment and we can't stick with it. But the opposite of it is gratitude. Gratitude is a coping skill. It is a chosen way of addressing life. It is a chosen way of addressing other human beings. It's a chosen way of addressing ourselves. Gratitude looks back and forth to know joy in the moment. And this is so key. We can look backward and we can see what God has done in our lives and in our world. And we can be grateful for that even when it was the result of 
of things that were difficult to deal with. And we can look forward with hope. No matter what happens, we know God's already won and we're going to win with him. We already know the outcome of this game. So we can look forward with hope. We can look backward with appreciation. And the result is in the moment, thanksgiving or gratitude, which helps us to live in the moment and appreciate and enjoy exactly what is a part of this day. Now, the secret, of course, is joy that is grounded in thanksgiving. And the key to that secret is Christ's presence. And I'm going to show you how this works in Paul's writing. Now, one of the places that really is curious to me is verse 5. I, I don't always know whether you guys see the same quirky stuff I do or whether I'm even right. But I read this passage in Philippians chapter 4, and I'm walking through it, and there's a ton of it that just jumps out to me. And then I realize that I keep kind of glossing over verse 5. Do you do the same thing when you read it? So, frankly, if, the, if it read like this in the English, rejoice in the Lord always, I'll say it again, rejoice. Don't, let, don't be anxious about anything. That would make sense to me. So there's this parenthetical expression in here, and I was fine that when I was reading this over and over again, I was just quickly glossing through verse 5. But I do know this about Paul. First of all, he writes amazingly elegant, eloquent, incredible classical Greek. This is why if you ever take Greek, Paul will not be the first thing you translate. Paul will not be the second thing you translate. Most of us, when we take Greek, we translate 1 John. It's really easy to translate. And then we go to Mark the easiest of the Gospels, eventually we're going to find our way to Romans, the hardest book in the Bible to translate or in the New Testament. Really difficult Greek because Paul writes these long run-on paragraphs, which was the way formal Greek was written, but also because Paul has this unbelievable vocabulary. You don't know this in the English, but in the Greek, you, it, it, there are half the vocabulary, the words of the vocabulary in a book like 1 John that there are in Philippians, which is not that big a book. I'm going to show you, for example, in a moment, a, a word that Paul uses that's used nowhere else in the New Testament, and it applies to this verse. Well, I found myself asking, because two things will make Paul's statements jump off the page at me, or anything in the Bible, and one of them is if it's something that is counterintuitive and takes me by surprise and just knocks me over, bowls me over. And, and that's where I get at the end of this section. There's just, sometimes you read something and... It cap Have you ever done this? It captures you so much that you just lay the book down and you just, you just think for a moment. That's how I was last week when I remembered uh, the comment that Henry Nouwen made that was uh, from The Return of the Prodigal Son, one of my favorite of his books, but I haven't read it in years. I don't think I've read it since seminary, oddly enough. I have quoted it, but haven't read it. And so I just went back and read the whole book, and it's, a, it's not a hard read. And I got to this section on gratitude, and, and I, I was so stunned by that paragraph and a half, two paragraphs, that I just laid the book down and just went, wow. I, I just got to focus on this for a minute. So that's one thing. But the other thing is if something doesn't seem to fit. You know, it's there, but why? What purpose does this have? And in the thought stream of Paul in Philippians 4, verse 5 just doesn't seem to fit to me. It fits in other places in things he writes, just not here. You know, let your gentleness be evident to all. Let everybody see you're gentle because the Lord is near. Paul, what are you really trying to convey? Now, what I do immediately is to go to a couple of other translations and see what they say. And the King James Version had a whole different rendering. So in the King James Version... It says, let your moderation be known by all. Now, that's an interesting change of twist. I don't think of gentleness and moderation being the same thing, do you? Now, part of this is that the word has changed. So when we say moderate now, we mean middle of the road, stand for nothing, reserved in all situations. We mean self-limiting. That's what we mean by, by moderate. But moderation in the day... In, in the 17th century, moderation used to mean the capacity to modulate your response to a given situation in an appropriate way. And so when I looked at that word, I thought, huh, I wonder if the modern translators avoid the word moderation because it doesn't make sense to the modern ear. 
that is the case. I can tell you. And so when I looked at it, I thought, all right, I got to go look at the Greek and see what it says. And what I found fascinated me. It is a word I was I'd forgotten if I ever learned it. And the reason I've forgotten it is that it occurs only here in the entire New Testament. Even its root form only occurs in a few places. So I'm not likely to see it any place else. But only here do I see the word epiaikos. Really interesting word. And epiaikos means, as it turns out, reasonableness or fairness. That's not exactly the same thing as gentleness, is it? Reasonableness. Moderation. I started to recognize that what Paul's trying to tell me, I think, is this. That because the Lord is near... I have the capacity to respond correctly for God's glory in every given situation. Now, this is something our culture needs to learn because we're unable to moderate our responses right now. People get furious about things that just don't matter. We call it microaggressions. They get upset about nothing. Some little tiny little liberty that's been taken from me or whatever. And they ignore huge inequities in our culture. They ignore enormous problems relative to the word of God and the way we regard things like poverty and race and ethnic, things like that. They ignore them completely. How can you get, I, I find myself saying when I read some people's social posts, how can you get so mad about this over here and this over here doesn't bother you at all? No, no see, in Christ, I'm looking at the situation. I'm asking not only how does it affect me, but how does it affect and impact others? And when I ask that question, then I modulate my response in Christ to that situation. So sometimes an impassioned response is right. The seven abolitionists who founded Columbia were right to be passionate about abolishing slavery. That's worth being passionate about. But sometimes I just have to let it go. It's no big deal. It's not a problem. Choose not to be offended. Paul says this in another place. And that's what I think he's saying. Now you couple that with what's bowl you over powerful at the end of this passage and you come up with something amazing. So like many of you, I grew up memorizing Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, just not like this. So in the NIV it reads, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Would it surprise me if I told you if I told you? That no verse I've been reading has warranted the response from our congregation like this one. And it hasn't been positive. So basically, almost everybody who hits me up on this one. A good friend of mine texted me last Sunday and said, hey, something's eating on me. When a pastor sees that, you're like, oh, Lord, what did I do? But it's not that. It's, it's this. I don't like the way the NIV says Philippians 4, 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. They said, that's not the way I learned it. <laughs> not the way you memorized it either. You grew up where I did. You memorized it like this. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. How many of you know that scripture? All right, now listen, I get this because, I get this, because as a standalone memory verse, that one just seems so powerful and jarring. But as written right there, let's ask honestly, is it true? Is it? Can you really do anything through Christ? The answer is no. You can do anything God wants you to do. You can do anything God's enabled you to do. But you can't do anything. I had some fun in the Mediator series playing with the fact that we do have these superpowers to mediate the presence of Christ, but one of them is not flying. Okay, I, I just want to make sure I say this at some point because I'm afraid some of you are confused. I can't really fly. I just want to make that clear. That was a camera trick. William did that. But I want to. I really want to fly. So let's say that you catch me at the top of a very tall building. And I turn to you and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And I get ready to jump. Are you going to go, fly baby, fly or stop? Stop. Gravity's going to get you. Right. I can't do anything I want to. I can't do all things. And as it turns out, that is just not what the Apostle Paul was saying. It's not at all what he was saying. 
My version, this is the rough translation of the Greek, the Dr. J version, in all things I have endurance in the one who is empowering me. Tell me how different that is. In all things I have endurance in the one who is empowering me. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying is all these things I'm going through right now, the imprisonment, the wonder about whether I'll live or die, the separation from others, everything that's happened to me, the torture, all of it, God gives me exactly what I need to meet this moment. It reminds me a great deal of a plaque my grandmother used to have in her kitchen window. I read it every morning I was at her house. <clears throat> and this, this plaque said, Lord, help me to remember that nothing is going to happen today that you and I can't handle together. That's what Paul's saying. God knew we would have a pandemic. He gives us the grace to deal with it. God knows about the diagnosis you just got. He gives you the grace to deal with it. It's hard to say, but it's true. God knew about your financial difficulties, your job situation. He gives you the grace to deal with it. God knew your marriage was going to hit a bad place. He gives you the grace to deal with it. So what the Apostle Paul is saying is I can endure anything. Because my ultimate goal is to glorify God. So my first question is, is God being glorified in this moment? And Paul's learned that God is glorified when terrible things happen sometimes. That that's the moment when God's strength is most apparent. Now you put those two things together, right? My ability to respond appropriately in any given situation because Christ is near, because the Lord is near, and my capacity to endure all things for the same reason, in Christ Jesus. And now I have a potent formula for this contentment and this gratitude that Paul talks about. Now that brings us to the scripture for today. And I told you that I'm using the experiential lens of Philippians 4, but if I were teaching a seminary course and you were my seminary students, I would begin with Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's like the sun of Philippians, and everything else in Philippians orbits around this sun that's right at the center. It's like the wall, the theological wall on which Paul hangs portraits of what's happening in his life and what's happening in the church and what's happening in the world. That's what this is, and so this is a cool passage. If you do take a seminary course, your professor will tell you one of the reasons we love this is we're almost positive it contains an ancient hymn. You know, you've learned a lot of your theology from the songs that you sing, and I'm just going to tell you honestly, you've learned some great theology and you've learned some pretty lousy theology from the songs that you sing. At the end of the day, we remember what we sing, and so Paul does what every good preacher does, and he appeals to something they already know, and it resonates with them. And so in verses 5 through 11 of this passage, what we have is a hymn. And we know that for two reasons. First of all, because Paul renders it in verse. So he shows us, this is something other than my writing. I'm quoting something here, and, and it, it occurs in verse. And the second reason we believe it's a hymn of the early church is because it so reflects the core kerygma, or the core or teaching of the early church. Now, I've taught you this before, but the struggle for the early Christians was not to convince people that Jesus was God. People in the ancient world believed that human beings could be divine. What was difficult was for them to explain that the Creator could become flesh. And that's what's captured in this particular piece of this hymn. And that's what we think it is. We think it's a fragment of a hymn. Now listen carefully to this passage. You'll love its beauty, but you probably already know it. Therefore, if any encouragement you have from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with each other, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, the NIV says, by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, 
even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge or confess as you learned it that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now Paul says his joy can be completed. The question is how? The first thing we see here, and this is an easy point, but that Paul is saying that his joy can be completed in the church. (laughs) He doesn't say the church is the source of his joy. That's the presence of Christ. He, He does not say that the church is even necessary for him to be joyful. That's Christ. But what he does say is that his joy can be completed in the church. Now let's think about that for a second. If the love of God shown in the cross of Jesus is the seed of our joy. And if the fertilizer of that is the presence of Christ and the Holy Spirit with us, the water and the fertilizer, it is nonetheless true that we see it come to full flower in the field of the church. I get this. I don't know what you guys miss about church, if anything. But what I miss about being among God's people in the church is hearing the stories they tell about what God is doing. What I miss is seeing them work together for something common that they can't accomplish alone. What I miss is the flowering I see of the joy of Christ in the church of Jesus. I miss seeing it. I understand what Paul's saying here. Now, Paul's removed from the church. He's in prison. He's saying to them, nonetheless, let me see it. Let me watch it. Show me it's true. That Jesus changes everything. Make my joy complete. It's fascinating the way he shows it, which tells me he really is a preacher. Can't count the number of times I would want to say something like this. You know, for God's sake, people, if you have any encouragement, just a shred from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any, just a shred of common sharing in the Spirit, just just a modicum of tenderness and compassion, that will be enough for you to make my joy complete. Now, how do you do it? Like-minded, having the same agape, love agape, the self-giving love of Jesus being one spirit. Is Paul saying here that we are the body of Christ when we agree with each other on everything? No. No. He's not saying we have to have the same politics. He's not saying that's not important. He's just saying that's not what unites us. He's not saying we have to wear the same clothes. He's not saying we have to go to the same restaurants or watch the same movies or watch no movies. He's not saying that. He doesn't have to say we have to live in the same exact... Re- he doesn't say we have to be the same color. None of this. In fact, it's quite the opposite. What he's saying is that the body of Christ can have together the mind of Christ and be bound together by the one spirit despite all of our differences. That is the evidence that something has happened human beings can't accomplish, only God can. And that's why the joy flowers in the church. The joy flowers for me when I see things happen in the church that can't happen anywhere else. How about you? That's when joy flowers for me. When I see God's people do things that they wouldn't do out in the world, that's, that's what thrills me. So Paul says, make my joy complete. Then it gets really interesting. I'd suggest to you that gratitude produces, produces humility. Now here's the problem, friends. The way we do gratitude in the United States of America often produces pride instead of humility. Can you just think about it for a moment and agree with me? So listen. If you guys do the Thanksgiving thing where everybody shares one thing they're grateful for, we should just write it down on post-it notes, stick it on the wall. We go to the same place every year, and when we go back, they'll be there. We just go, you know what? There's the list. Everybody eat. Thanks, God. The list is going to be the same. And it's a pride list. Well, I just want to I just want to thank God for all he's allowed me to accomplish in my career this year. It's been amazing. Really pretty amazing. Thank you, God. That one's there sometimes. Oh, how about this one? I just want to thank God for our family. This is the best family on earth. There's not another family like ours. And what we really should say is our family's pretty much like everybody else's family. We're grateful for family, yours and mine. This one always comes up. 
I'm just grateful to live in the United States of America and freedom. I see the flag, it makes me cry. All right, look, I'm grateful for that too. But the way we say it tends to ensconce pride and not humility. I think the mark of a great nation is humility in accomplishment. Humility. Paul says that. And so listen, for Paul, humility is produced by the process of gratitude and not pride. And this is how he does it. If you just take a look here, he says, don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. And then he gets to this hymn, and in this hymn, the key, the the core of this hymn is verse 7. Rather, he being Jesus, made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Now, here's where I stub my toe. So I looked at this, and I thought, that's an intriguing statement. Do I really believe it? Now, you say it's in the Bible, you better believe it. Well, I'm going to make sure it's in the Bible. I'm going to make sure that's what's there. So, is the expectation really that those of us who have quote-unquote humility should make ourselves nothing? In the culture's view, maybe so. I've heard many people say, that person is a very humble person. And the person they're referring to is often somebody who says very little in any situation. They're demure, they're the reserved, they're not what, what people would call leaders, except perhaps by example, and somebody will say that person's just so humble, they're so humble, they're so hum-. Well, look, I'm never going to be that person. <laughs> Do you know me? It's not going to happen. I, I'm not going to be the person who never says anything. It's not going to happen. I don't even think that's a good stewardship of my gifts and skills. So is that really what I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to think of myself as nothing? Because here's the thing. I counsel with people every week who think nothing of themselves. And it turns out not to produce very good results in human beings' lives. When a person thinks nothing of themselves, they act like nothing. They wind up getting themselves into all kinds of messes. Is that really What that says, now, the counter to that is not true either. We don't want to convince our children they're everything either, right? So the question is, Paul, what are you trying to tell me? So here's what I did in this circumstance is I went back to the Greek. And the Greek's rather fascinating here. Now, I already knew a little of this because this hymn is called the canonic hymn by New Testament scholars. Canonic means emptying, process of emptying. So I, I go to the Greek of verse 7, and it says, Hutan echinosin morphin dulo laban. And so I look at that, and I, I know these words pretty well. And so I, I say, wait a second, Paul. Now I see what you're saying. Now here's the Dr. J translation, rough translation. This is, this is really rough. This is exactly the order the words are in. Himself emptied the form of a servant having taken. Himself emptied having the form of of a servant taken. In fact, the NASB does a nice job with this. And if you guys study the Bible a lot, you want a copy of the New American Standard alongside whatever you're reading because it's very wooden translation. So word for word, it's very accurate. Phrase for phrase, sometimes it's not right. Um, and it's hard to read. A public reading of it is painful, but it's wooden. And, and so you see the actual words. And this is what the NSAB says. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Hmm. Is making myself nothing the same thing as emptying myself? No. Not in the least. It's not boot licking. It's not stooping. It's not saying, oh, you know what? I'm just nothing. It's not that. It is regarding the gifts that God gives me as being given to me as accessible to others for their benefit and not my own. But what it is is the emptying of ambition. Now we're back to the beginning of the sermon. You remember all those expectations I had? Those crazy unrealistic expectations that I stamp on everything? That's what I empty myself of. It's that. It's ambition. This is what Jesus did. I've read some New Testament scholars who are quite wrong, in my opinion, who say kenosis means that Jesus emptied himself of divinity. No! No! The Bible's really clear. He was fully human and what? Fully divine. He took on humanity without emptying divinity. 
He was fully divine. He was the Son of God incarnate. So no, it's not that. So if he didn't empty himself of divinity to become a man, what did he empty himself of? What is common to every man and every woman, and that is ambition. And the way he did this was through obedience. Now this is possible. I can unload my expectations. It's not easy, but gratitude and obedience are the tools that will get me there. I can let them go. It doesn't mean I don't want to accomplish anything. It doesn't mean I don't aspire to anything. It means that I am, in essence, saying, Lord, whatever you choose for me to do today, and whatever you give me today, and whatever my situation is eternally the best thing there is for me, and I receive it with grace and joy. Thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. Recently in my little journal, writing down things I've, that are painful in my life and saying thank you for them has been a real changer for me. Things are like crushing to me. But saying thank you, Lord, for that. If you're going to use that for your glory, then thank you for it. Now the key is obedience. Paul says after saying this, he says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So here's the one thing Jesus was willing to do. He was willing to put his own self-interest aside so that you and I could be spared, saved. And that allowed the Apostle Paul later to sit in a prison cell and say, I've lost all liberties in the moment, but I am eternally delivered. And so I'm grateful, even right here, right now. Jesus didn't want to die. I love that the Bible tells us that, that it, that they don't leave out, that he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, fell to his knees and said, Lord, please, Father, please, please, no, take this cup from me. But after struggling so much that he cried and sweated beyond what I, any human being I've ever seen do, he says, but Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And that obedience is an expression of gratitude. Do you see? I receive it. I accept it with grace. I thank you, Father, that you're with me. Jesus' obedience is the model that Paul holds up, and it's the model he tries to follow. And so the mindset of Christ that he talks about, I think, can be defined pretty well as gratitude. We could probably call this mindset some other things too, but, but gratitude works best for me. What is this mindset in which we modulate ourselves to the situation, in which we receive all circumstances with grace, in which we're contented in the middle of any situation, in which we put others' interests before ours? It is gratitude. That's what it is. It's as good a word as we have to define what this mindset of the church should be. See, the discipline of gratitude shifts our attention away from us and to God and what he is doing and how he's being glorified. It's not that we don't have anxieties. It takes our attention off of those anxieties. He puts our attention on the right things and the way that God is accomplishing those things. Because gratitude focuses our attention on God's glory. And because of that we come to the point that we're able to resonate with Paul. When he writes at the end of that section. Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11. Therefore. That's such so fascinating to me. It's because Jesus was so obedient. It's because he emptied himself of his ambition. It's because he was grateful. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess or acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, listen to me. Someday every knee is going to bow. Someday... Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Some may do it from the depths of hell, but they will cry out that Jesus is Lord. Gratitude gets us ahead of the game, right? It gets us to the place where we're glorifying him now. Our knees are bowed, our tongues confess Jesus is our Lord, and it's his glory that is the main thing in our lives. And Anything that puts us on a path to that glory 
well. Gratitude is the discipline we use to receive it with grace and know joy in the moment that we will someday know forever. It's powerful. It's just powerful. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for Philippians and for the Apostle Paul who gave it to us and for the way that you used it as your word in my life and in the life of the church. I thank you for the knowledge that a group of Christians like us in a city like ours received this letter at some point and read it for the very first time and no doubt was just blown away by it. And I thank you that we who've read it a hundred times, a thousand, heard it proclaimed that we're able to to pick it up like we're reading it for the first time and find something that we've never seen before because you are speaking by your Holy Spirit to our hearts, maybe to some people through me and maybe to me through them, but always to us through your word, the scriptures. And Lord, I thank you for the capacity to be grateful. What a strange thing to say. I'm grateful for the capacity to be grateful because of the joy it brings to me when I pour out my expectations and ambitions and receive what you give with grace and hope, courage. And Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would enable your people to take on the mindset of Jesus, to be grateful, and thereby to be a model to the rest of the world that something flowers in the church that is impossible anywhere else. Lord, make our joy complete in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you would, watch a few messages before you go. As you prepare to go ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world, I have a couple of things I want to share with you. First, for those of you who have been at Columbia in years past, you know that our food pantry has an event every November called Thanksgiving Share. It is where we bless our guests with extra food the week before Thanksgiving to help them celebrate Thanksgiving with food on their table. This year will be no different. So even though Thanksgiving is over a month away, we want you to start planning to be a part of this event. Go to columbiabaptist.org list to get the list of items we are collecting and then start shopping over the coming weeks. And on Saturday, November 7th, you can drop the food off when you come to pick up your Spend Yourself race packets. Again, just go to columbiabaptist.org list to get the list and all the details. Lastly, students 7th through 12th grade, we will see you tonight in the 301 parking lot for some pumpkin party fun. Come out to have a blast with other students playing pumpkin games, eating great food, and enjoying being together. You can park in Columbia's main parking lot. Just make sure you enter from the Washington Street entrance as there is no other entrance on the other side. Then make your way over to the 301 building. It is going to be an awesome night that you do not want to miss. Thanks for being with us today. Again, if you are new to Columbia, please go to columbiabaptist.org connect and let us know who you are. We would love to get connected with you and send you a welcome gift. Now, as Whole Life Disciples, let your gratitude to God determine who you are, wherever you are. Have a fantastic day, and we will see you back next week. Now, my friends, empty yourself of those expectations that you might be completed in the joy of Christ, filled completely with Him. You go and ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world. I love you. I miss you. I'm praying for you. Hope to see you soon.